Elton Claudio, I've just been watching your video and I want to comment a little bit on this. I'm, I'm holding a lavalier and realizing I don't have the end of it, so I don't have anywhere to any way to attach it. So I have a uh, glass of wine here that's empty. I gotta, I gotta solve this before we get on to the video. All right, hold on. I'm gonna be very French here. All right. <laughs> okay, this is the end of my bottle of wine. It has been a five video day. I've been recording all day. We've got this whole Canadian thing going on, which is super interesting. I'm very looking forward to seeing how that plays out. I gotta figure out where's this missing piece? I don't know what's going on. Well now I'm bummed. Where's where's my clip? Alright, hold on. Alright, I've just been watching your video and I have some notes that I'm hoping that my audio is good on this because I'm holding this awkward way on the Fuji. Hey everybody. So okay, so one of the comments on the video that you guys did, awesome video by the way. Love it. Um, so $46 a day is what they quote is the average up from 41, which is obviously that's great. That's more than 10% increase. So uh, one of the things about that, first of all, that's a per person. So if you're looking at a family, you got a family of four, family of five, you're looking at 200 to $250 per day for a family. Suddenly that number starts to make a little bit more sense. If you're getting a hotel room, even if you're going into Managua, you're getting the Hilton uh, Double Tree. You manage to get a deal for $100 a day. That leaves you $100 to $150 for food and other things around the city. That is lean, but you can see how even in Managua, staying at an American hotel, you can make it work. You come into Leon, you go into Granada, you go into Acatal, and you get a hotel for $50 to $60 a day for the family. Now you have a budget of $150 to $200 a day for entertainment and food, and now it makes a lot of sense. So, so that's the first piece. Second, this is an average, right? An average in-country expenditure. Now, this is important. In Nicaragua, this is a pandemic almost. There is a problem that a ton of people uh, run under the table, kind of off the books, accommodations. And now, of course, some people are just staying with family. Like, that's different. But a ton of people are doing off-the-books accommodation. So there's a lot of places, for example, Airbnb. If you were to come into Nicaragua and you're going to say, I'm going to stay in an Airbnb, chances are you're going to pay with a credit card. That credit card is going to be accepted in the United States, maybe in Canada. It's going to process. You're going to get your Airbnb. You're going to move in, and you're going to be good to go. And that's going to be the largest expendi a single expenditure that you have on a day-to-day -day basis while you're on your trip to Nicaragua. That money is not going into Nicaragua. That money is going to the United States or Canada because it went through a credit card processor outside the country and was done online. That's a major problem for Nicaragua because their money is going elsewhere. So even though the accommodation is inside the country, even though in theory that money should be being spent inside the country, in a really large number of cases, it is not. And so there's a huge amount of money being spent by visitors in Nicaragua, but the money isn't coming into the country. So that $46 a day, I'm pretty confident is based on how much is actually being spent in Nicaragua, not the total amount that someone is spending on their vacation. So that number is meaningful to the government or to investors who are saying, what is our growth? What is our potential for making money? That is a, that's probably a true number. But if the question is, how much does a vacation cost someone? They're not spending an average of $46 a day. They're probably spending an average of closer to 70 to 80 per day per person just because there's so much transactions happening outside the country that are not being captured for taxes, not being captured for revenue, not being captured for reporting in a situation like this. So two big factors, spending outside the, the country, and that includes children in that number. When you're looking at a family, obviously the numbers make a lot more sense. All right, question number two, Lonely Planet. Look, I used to love Lonely Planet. I used to buy their books. I'd be like, wow, Lonely Planet puts in so much work getting to know a place, giving me guidance on a place. What a fantastic thing. Once I got to Nicaragua and started talking to people, it, this is an amazing change, right? When I lived in the United States, uh, the number of people that I knew who like owned hotels was zero. I, I worked in hotels and didn't know any people who were who owned hotels. Now that I live in Nicaragua, 
I know lots of people who own hotels, tons of them. And one of the things about hotel owners in Nicaragua is we all talk to each other. And one of the things that we learned really quickly is that everybody knows the Lonely Planet guy. And they all know when the last time he was here was. And that's pushing a decade. And they all know that the information in the Lonely Planet Guide was not accurate at the time it was published and absolutely completely false in the time since then. Because they keep publishing guides, but they haven't sent anyone to update them. And this is really easy to track when you, when you are connected to the people who own hotels. Because they all talk to each other. And if someone was actually going from hotel to hotel, we would all know. And they know this from the past that it happened. And they also know from looking at the Lonely Planet Guide that it's completely fabricated. The current guide, at least half of the places that they list have been out of business for an absurd amount of time, six, seven years. So think about if you're, if you're buying a guide from Lonely Planet and you're like, all right, I've got the, the current Nicaragua guide. That's I'm paying for this to guide me to things. So when you're dealing with, with Nicaragua, things move fast, much faster than in the U.S. as far as businesses go. So a hotel, a restaurant that is the hot thing today could be out of business tomorrow. That's very common. Things just turn over quickly. Who's on top? Who's not? Very rapid change. When you're out on the beach, it's accelerated. Like, it's it's completely crazy. I've been on the beach investing for three years, and the number of businesses that have popped up, thrived, failed, gone out of business, been purchased, reopened, like, half the places are doing that. It's crazy. So when you're looking at these guides, suddenly you realize, oh, my gosh, they're recommending places that have been out of business for several generations of investors. This stuff is so completely out of touch with the actual situation on the beach. They're calling a place that's on the verge of bankruptcy and has been for years completely on the verge of failure, has nothing working, no investment, no plan for the future. We don't even know why they're in business or how long they'll be in business. Their list is like the most popular place. And places they'll be like, this is the best restaurant, everyone goes there. It's been out of business for so long that I've never heard of it. And this just goes on and on. I'm very lucky. I have businesses that are listed in Lonely Planet. So even if they fail, I can just reopen, slap that name on anything, and people will just read Lonely Planet and be like, oh, this place, this place is amazing. Lonely Planet says it's the best. And I have guaranteed traffic because I own the name. That's a, that's a ridiculous situation, but I'm in that position. I'm in that lucky position. But a lot of people are in the unlucky position of having opened a new business, doing really well, putting in a ton of work, and then Lonely Planet pretends that they don't exist because they haven't updated in seven years, but they put it out as if it's updated. So Lonely Planet, what we've learned from Lonely Planet, much like House Hunters International, is that it's just faked. It's, there's no reason for Lonely Planet to go out and make real recommendations because there's no money in that. That's not financially viable. Just putting out old recommendations, like a passingly plausible bit of information about the country, that's enough. No person who bought that book is ever going to come back and take legal action. No one's ever going to ask for their money back. No one's ever going to say, hey, you sold me a book under false pretenses. No one but me. Everybody on the beach talks about it. It's like a big joke. All the people who buy Lonely Planets, like they make fun of, oh, wow, they just totally got taken for a ride. But... In general, people aren't aware that this is going on. But if you think about the economics of something like Lonely Planet, it's absolutely logical. There's no reason for them to go out of their way to keep their information up to date. There's no reason for them to be um, complete. All they do is send a person around. He samples a couple places, goes, I like this place. I don't like this place. This place seems busy. This place doesn't seem busy. He's only there for a day or two and then makes a recommendation. Every person I know can make better recommendations on the beach than Lonely Planet. They have no information that we don't have. They don't have any research. They don't have any writers. They don't have any person based here. They have not a single, to the best of my knowledge, not a single person in the country. So they're not an expert resource. They're not even a plausible resource. They're beyond a reprehensible resource at this point, to look at, so I've stopped buying their stuff. I won't buy anything from Lonely Planet now that I know what they do in Nicaragua. It's, they, they can't be trusted. They have no integrity. 
and they're completely willing to put out books based on one random guy's one week tour of the country and his think about it. Every random backpacker has just as much information as one Lonely Planet writer. And in many cases, they have much more. So it's what a terrible thing. So that's my start on the whole Lonely Planet thing. Trust nothing that they put out. Just don't, don't deal with them. All right. People coming here because it's cheap. I totally agree. Claudio's correct. We don't want people coming here because it's cheap. That's a dumb reason to go to a country. If you're coming from a place that's expensive, the whole world's cheap. Like, get over it. Just everything's cheap. Knock yourself out. There's, there's two things with this. One is if people are seeking just cheap, yeah, well, well Nicaragua is probably not the place to come. We hear this all the time. It's so expensive. Well, it's not. It's, it's pretty cheap. But there are cheaper places. East Africa, Southeast Asia, there's places where you're gonna, your money's just going to go farther. If you're basing your travel and your desire for things off of wanting to be incredibly inexpensive, then Nicaragua falls into a, yeah, it's decent category, but it doesn't fall into the super ultra uber cheap category. So that's a weird reason to come here based on that. But also, nobody wants anyone coming somewhere based on that. That's a terrible engagement reason. Um, everyone's going to be unhappy. The people who are selling you things, who are trying to provide tours, who want to, you know, run a good restaurant, have a nice hotel, they're never going to be someone that you like because the fact that they're charging you is just going to be negative. And you don't want to pay anything. So the people who want to make a livelihood off of you by offering you a service are not going to engage well with you either. They're going to see you as a negative. So everybody loses in that situation. Just no one ends up happy. That's that's bad. And and if you're being super cheap, let's say you're just you're on a crazy budget and and it is what it is, then Nicaragua has little to gain by allowing you to come. It doesn't do them any good to uh, you know, have you here, you're not going to create jobs, you're not going to boost the economy, you're kind of just in the way, you you pose a big negative. And so the country doesn't actually want those people. And the businesses in the country don't want those people. And everyone else, basically, no one wants those people, even the expats don't want those people. And it's not that we don't want people who are on a budget. It's not that we're not accommodating of people who are on a budget. Obviously, Nicaragua is inexpensive, and that is a major draw, and especially for the expats. We talk about it constantly, but I do talk about that it needs to be, look, it is inexpensive, but so are a lot of other places, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, you guys mentioned them. Nicaragua isn't cheap enough to like, oh, I'm not going to go to those other places. Nicaragua is so cheap. I'm just going there. That doesn't make any sense. They're all so close that you need to make your determining factor on many other things. And there's lots of other parts of the world that are cheaper still. So if cheap is your goal, Nicaragua, it can be on your short list, but it's not going to be selected for that reason. But it's just a bad engagement. It's not something that we want. So nobody wins when you have that. Um, so anything that advertises Nicaragua as the cheapest, that's probably bad. Putting Nicaragua into a category with many other cheap places, probably good. You do have people who say, look, I, I got this, you know, 20% of the world is within a price category that makes sense for me. And Nicaragua falls into that. Okay, that's good. Nicaragua is 0.1% cheaper than Guatemala. So I'm going to go there because I, I can't afford to live. I appreciate the people who are struggling and need Nicaragua to bail them out. It's a real thing. But we really struggle as an economy and as a culture here because we are inundated by people who are using Nicaragua as a, as a failover option, as a backup option, as a last-ditch effort to pay their bills instead of coming here because they love it. And, and routinely, that's bad for Nicaragua in almost all cases. And the people who come under those circumstances in almost all cases are just don't end up happy because it's not where they wanted to be. They didn't choose it for good reasons. They choose it because they ch chose it because they felt trapped. And I see that in a lot of comments that I get, people who feel trapped and stuck. And, and those people are never that happy. They might be like, I do appreciate that Nicaragua was bailing me out, but I'm bitter or angry or hurt or sad or whatever because I'm in that situation. The last thing I wanted to do is, why did I come? So I'm in the, the enviable position of, of, I own a company. I'm able to live 
essentially anywhere. Um, you can pick the world's most expensive countries, right? Japan, Germany, uh, France, Monaco, um, what Singapore, whatever, uh, Switzerland, Norway. Those are all places I could live. Now, to go to super expensive ones, I'm not going to live as well. Obviously, I'm not a trillionaire. So yeah, they're going to notice that they're more expensive. It's going to change my lifestyle. Uh, so the fact that Nicaragua is less expensive is a draw? Absolutely. But I lived in Spain, Italy, Greece, Romania, Ukraine, Panama, Nicaragua. And it was a tough decision as to where to go. But in the end, Nicaragua won out. But but not as a slam dunk. It was a, it was a near thing. But we came to Nicaragua because we loved the culture and the blend of things. And honestly, with the way we live, Spain was cheaper. A number of places that we had access to are actually cheaper for our lifestyle. So Nicaragua was on the cheap side. It was very inexpensive, very good cost of living. But at no point did it hit our radar as the absolute cheapest. Uh, it actually has some barriers for us. It actually has some costs for us that make it not bad, but but not the cheapest. We really do love Nicaragua. That is that is just at the core of our experience here. Um, and and we put in time nine years ago, and this wasn't an overnight decision. Uh, and and having had a good amount of time in Nicaragua, we just felt it. Um, and I say this often in in the show. Like sometimes you just have to feel that it it just hits you right. It's just the place for you. And and a ton of you who are like, I'm really serious about Nicaragua. You're going to come, you're going to get off the plane, and you're going to go, it's not the place for me. This just doesn't do it. Somebody just posted on my, on my thread, I hit the 505 hard pass. But he gave it a shake. Like, thanks. Thanks for coming down and, and, and taking it seriously and putting in some effort. You got off the plane. You put in a week. I don't know, a month, maybe a year. I don't know. He put in some time and he said, no, wasn't for me. That's okay. It's totally okay. That is the expectation. A lot of people, it doesn't matter what country you are. Name the country. If you take a person that on paper says this is a viable candidate, they get off that plane, half of them at least are going to be like, not for me. It's fine. I wouldn't be sad. I wouldn't be angry. I could make do, but I'm not choosing it. There's 187 plus countries in the world. The chances that any one is going to be the place for some huge percentage of the population, not likely. So that Nicaragua is the right choice for any sizable percentage of people is truly amazing. And I think that number is way larger than the physical size or the population of Nicaragua would, would indicate. Now, I'm, I'm really impressed by that, and it's amazing. But it does require people to come down and really feel it. And for us, it took a little bit of time. But pretty quickly, when we were in Nicaragua the first time, we said, you know what? There's just something, something different, something that I love Panama. But Panama didn't have that thing. It didn't quite make me have to stay. It made me say, I love this region. I want to learn more. Nicaragua didn't make me say that. Nicaragua made me say, oh, this is the place. This is where I need to stay. And it's been now nine years since we first came, more than three years since we've been here continuously. I don't regret that but I also don't see it as a super cheap location. So I, I agree with Claudio. I don't want people in, in general coming here because it's so cheap. I want that to be like this extra little thing. Like, ooh, I love the culture. I love the food. I love the people. I love the, the nightlife. I'm so excited about living in Nicaragua. Wait, I get it for cheap? Yes. Right? It needs to be a yes at the end. It's the icing, not the cake. It is very, very hard to look at relocation and not be totally focused on the cost of living, but it shouldn't be that. It should be included. It should be a factor. You should rule out places that make no financial sense for you. But whether you're going to Nicaragua or someplace that's 10% more, uh, unless you're absolutely desperate, and I understand, but unless you're absolutely desperate, you should have a band of plus minus 
that makes sense. And of course, if you find someplace way cheaper, like, well, okay, half the price, that's fine, right? But you should be willing to spend a little bit more. And you can. And you and if you spend just a little bit more than Nicaragua, you open up like half of Latin America is within a relatively close price band to Nicaragua. And you should be willing to, to consider those places when you're looking from a cost perspective, unless you absolutely can't. And then come to Nicaragua and choose here because it's fantastic, because it just feels right, because it makes you happy. Because when you wake up in the morning and you go, where am I? I'm in Nicaragua. I'm in Nicaragua. I'm happy because I'm in Nicaragua every morning. And then oh, this place is cheap too. It just gets better and better. That's how it should be. That is the feeling you should have. It should not be, I needed it to be cheap, and I'm happy it's Nicaragua. For some people, it's going to have to be that way. But for most people, you really want to make sure you're getting that, I found my happy, I found good, and it's cheap. Bonus. All right, thanks, guys. Really enjoyed the video. Uh, thanks for all you do. You guys are awesome. Uh, Elton, you put out some really important content, and uh, we all appreciate it very much. So have a good night. And uh, uh, hopefully I will see you at uh, some roundtable or podcast or something that we're doing sometime soon. Have a good night, everybody.